is it historical evidence or is it historical statements of people who were discussing a thing that may or may not have happened that might have been legend? I'm not an atheist. Like, I don't believe anybody that says they know what life is or what life means or what happens when you die. I want to hear your opinions. I want to hear your thoughts. But you don't know. And anybody that says they know what happens when they die, it'll be black and, and cold and that is the end. And just like there was nothing before, there'll be nothing at the end. And like, you don't know that. No. You're just saying that. Mm -hmm. What if you stand in front of God, it's in some non-physical form, and then you're, you're weeping in your, your arrogance and stating that there's no higher power. Like it might be the, the universe itself might be God. I mean, we don't know anything. You're only aware of what you've experienced. And so for Dawkins, since design is an illusion, the possibility of a designer is delusional. Uh, he argues that the strongest reason for believing in the existence of God was always the argument from design, the evidence from nature. And now that we know that that evidence is not pointing to an actual designer, but instead to an undirected process that merely mimics the power of a designing intelligence, we can safely conclude that God is either does not exist or has left no evidence whatsoever behind of his existence such that to believe in such a being is effectively delusional. This is the new atheism. Science properly understood undercuts belief in God. It conflicts with belief in God. There was a, a, a deep-seated conviction among the scientists who were founders in the various disciplines of science that nature was intelligible because it had been made by a rational intellect, namely the, it had been made by God. And because God was rational and He had a rational mind and had made us in His image such that we had rationality, we could indeed think God's thoughts after Him. We could perceive the rationality, the order, the design that had been built into the universe. That was the very foundation of science very much the opposite of the view you find with these um, new atheists. Like Ben Shapiro, who we discussed in this video, we believe God is showing himself to Joe Rogan through Christian guests on his show. The question is whether Joe would accept Jesus as Lord, repent of his sins, and ask Jesus to save him. Three key pieces of evidence I think support a robust case for God as an inference to the best explanation. I tend to take a an evidentialist and, and philosophical approach to the kinds of questions you're asking, including the question about why I believe the other parts of the Bible, not just about the creation of the universe, but about the historical witness of uh, Jesus, about Jesus Christ or the Exodus or things like that. And there I would say my general answer is that I have a strong avocational interest in the historicity of the Bible as one can test it based on external sources of historical evidence from documentary historical sources and archaeological sources. During this interview, Joe Rogan pressed Dr. Meyer on the resurrection of Jesus. Although his specialty is intelligent design, Dr. Meyer has an excellent answer for why he believes in the resurrection of Jesus. Who all agree with me about the, uh, the scientific evidence and what it points to, and then we have different discussions about but the I'm just, I want to know yeah. your thought okay, process. Okay, so my thought process. Crucial event in, for example, the New Testament is the trial and death of Jesus of Nazareth and subsequent resurrection. One key th really striking thing that I've discovered in my avocational interest in archaeology is that the five or six leading figures, uh, most important figures in that trial narrative, which, takes, which take up about a quarter to a third of the, the four Gospels, have all been independently attested by archaeological inscriptions in the last 50 or 60. There were some, in, there were some uh, construction workers working in Caesarea Maritima in Israel in 1960-ish turned over a big slab of rock, and on the back was an inscription from Pontius Pilate uh, listing himself as the governor of Judea with a tribute to Tiberius Caesar. Um, significant because in the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus is reported to have occurred when Tiberius was the, the uh, Roman emperor, Pilate was the governor, and we know all about in the trial that the, the key role that Pilate played. Uh, recently, the, and what what year was this attributed to? Well, it, it's 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 uh, attributed to the period of time in which Tiberius was emperor. So um, I think that was fifteen through. I 
15th through to 30... I can't remember the, the end of his emperorship, but it, it's, it's the time mentioned in the New Testament as to when Jesus did his thing. And you have recently in Jerusalem, under the traditional site of the high priest, was discovered the stone ossuary bearing the name of Caiaphas and Caiaphas ben Joseph on two sides of an ornately decorated ossuary mm -hmm. containing the bones of someone who was reburied by this practice that the Jews undertook during that unique period of time from about 20 BC to the destruction of the temple. So you have multiple figures from that key event who have been independently attested and established in that time period. Herod Antipas, we know from his coins and his building projects, all, uh, Jesus himself, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Annas, the other uh, high priest. So you have these multiple lines of external corroboration for this really important account. And then you have external sources like Josephus and mm -hmm. Tacitus. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a weight of external corroborating evidence. And that gives you, I think, a good reason to take the narrative seriously and to evaluate their other claims. It's, in fact, a level of corroboration that I think is almost unprecedented for any document that old. That's corroboration in terms of the narrative of the stories or corroboration in terms of the historical figures being real? Both. In Josephus... The narrative of the stories being the resurrection of Jesus? Reports of same. You find reports of... The, uh, in, in There's two different texts of Josephus, mm -hmm. one that was likely doctored by uh, medieval Christians that historians rightly... Um, regard as too affirmative in his uh, expression of belief in Jesus of Nazareth, and one that came to us through the Arabic world, where the, 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 the Josephus text is much more credible, where he records the basic facts of the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth, including being crucified under Pontius Pilate, and then that there were reports that he had been, that he had appeared to many after being resurrected. So there's a whole... Right, but there's reports of Bigfoot. Well, we have a we have you know I I, I, mean, I love human your being, I love particularly your, back then. Yeah, where there's no real access to universal information like the internet. There's no real I mean, there's no libraries. Like where where are you getting all your information from? Right. So you have one of the best formats in all of of talk anything because you have these long form discussions. But I think even this format will not lend itself to being able to wrestle the question of the right. no, historical realism. I don't, realism I don't think we're going to wrestle it. I just want to know why you. Three great scholars who have addressed the question of whether or not the, actually four. One is Wolfhard Pannenberg, the great German theologian, historian. One is William Lane Craig. One is N.T. Wright with his magisterial mm -hmm. tome, Direction of the Son of God. And the other is Gary Habermas. And there are numerous questions that come up in evaluating all this different type of historical testimony mm -hmm. regarding that seminal event, if true, in human history. Mm -hmm. right. And I've done a deep dive on that stuff, and I'm convinced that the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened as a real event in history. Because people said it did. Well, because of the various forms of testimony that we have, the historical evidence we have coming down to us from this day. But it is your personal belief. But it is my personal belief. And I, have, I would tell you, I have reasons to believe that that are well considered. And they are reasons not of subjective experience or subjective experience alone, but the reasons that ha are derived from having examined very detailed historical analyses of the relevant data. And that's uh, probably as far as we could take something in a discussion like this. But I, I do affirm that belief in such an extraordinary event should be well-grounded in historical evidence. We want to make crucial points here. First, as Christians, the truth enshrined in the Bible is sufficient for us to believe that God created the world in six days, which we will look into shortly, and that Jesus came to this world, died, and resurrected on the third day. We do not need external sources, per se, to believe in Jesus' resurrection. However, many archaeological discoveries and reliable historical documents prove that, indeed, Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected. And not something that we just believe because we want it to be true. Well, is it historical evidence or is it historical statements of people who were discussing a thing that may or may not have happened that might have been legend? Well, much historical evidence is also historical statement. Right, but this is an extraordinary event, right? right? You're talking about a resurrection of a right. person who died and right. came back right. and was the son of God. It's, this is a big claim. Yeah, it is a big claim. The, the, what historians must do is evaluate the reliability of historical testimony if mm -hmm. what's coming is, is historical testimony. Mm -hmm. One piece of historical testimony that's always been extremely compelling to, to me is the, historic, is the testimony of James, who is um, mentioned in the New Testament as one of the, um, the, the, the witnesses to whom Jesus appeared after the alleged resurrection event. Mm -hmm. Um, he was also mentioned earlier in the New Testament as one of his brothers or half-brothers, depending on whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic Christian, um, how you view that. Uh, but he was mentioned as one of family members who did not accept his crazy messianic claims, and right. he, he did not believe in it. In James's mind, we yes. later find that he becomes the leader of the Jerusalem Christian church, the early Jewish believers in Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
And there's, uh, uh, but we also then know from Josephus that James was was stoned to death, martyred for his witness mm -hmm. to to the resurrection. Now there's a kind of very simple argument, but it's, it goes back to one of the early Christian writers, Eusebius, saying that that uh, people will lie to uh, get out of trouble. They do it all the time. We mm -hmm. see it in our politics, but people don't lie to get into trouble. We're just assuming and, that and, they would let him lie or do anything to get out of well, trouble. Th there were there were many many uh, early Christians who died claiming to have seen the resurrected Jesus, but in the case of James, we know that he ex expressed that testimony, and we know it from an, a, an external to the Bible source, namely Josephus. What do you think of? So I think this is an example of okay. Here's an historical claim. What, how can we evaluate the? the reliability of that witness. People will give their lives for an abstract philosophy that they believe to be true. Right. People do not give their lives for a factual claim that they know to be false. That's lying to get into trouble. That's, true, but we know. don't know what James' mental state was. We don't know if James was schizophrenic. We, 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 there's we, so many variables that could be taken into consideration. It's, it's a question of weighing the preponderance right. of the evidence and delivering, deliberating on it over time. We commend Dr. Stephen Meyer for gently and graciously sharing his belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This underscores why Christians should be knowledgeable about the Word of God and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, according to 1 Peter 3, verse 15. You were saying something about, and I'm paraphrasing, but whatever this intelligent thing is, creating us somehow or another in its image, or somehow or another thinking the way it thinks? How did you, how did you say that again? Yeah, this was this was the idea of the early scientists who got science going. It was the, the, the way they talked about it was the intelligibility of the universe because our minds had been made in the image or likeness of the creator of the universe itself. Isn't it just possible that our minds are complex and curious, and so we're trying to figure out what all these things are and what DNA is and what molecules now we're trying to figure out the very fiber of existence itself. What 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 is it made out of? Wouldn't any curious self-aware creature start to contemplate these things and if it's if it really is an intelligent force that made us to think the way it thinks why would it have war why would it have murder why would it have all the horrific crimes that we see drug addictions why would it create us in a form like that the historian historians of science have asked a question it's the why why then why their question We've had all these great civilizations. Egyptians made the pyramids, as you and I were talking about. We had the um, uh, the, the Chinese had gunpowder. The Romans built aqueducts. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, in Western Europe, in the 16th and 17th centuries, and I think I think the antecedents for the, for that go back a little further, uh, you get these very systematic methods for study, studying nature arising, and you get this concern to use mathematics to describe the order in nature, and you get this incredibly productive. Uh, historians of science call it, they call it the scientific revolution. Something really dramatic changed. Mm -hmm. And and it's different than other civilizations. And as they they examined what happened, they said, well, the material, you know, the, the material substrate or the things you would need to do science were in all the other cultures. And there were many great cultures. But this this systematic method of studying nature uniquely arose in Western Europe in a particular time, in a particular context. And many, many historians of science have come to the conclusion that the, the thing that was the, the difference that made the difference was the worldview, was the philosophical assumptions of those Western European scientists who were almost entirely coming out of a Judeo-Christian worldview. These thinkers had the conviction that there were such patterns, there was mm. rationality, there was order behind things because there was a God who had made the universe to be orderly and to be understood. So that was just one of those thought differences or th differences in thinking that historians have identified as a, as, a, as a key feature that explains why the scientific revolution happened where it did. Dr. Stephen Meyer is a proponent of intelligent design, meaning that the universe and living things exist through an intelligent design, which Genesis 1 and 2 tell us God is the designer, rather than through an undirected process such as natural selection or the Big Bang. He's written a book where he pointed out Charles Darwin's own doubt about his proposition on the origin of life. In the book, he argued that the complexity of creation indicates an intelligent designer. And here's your beautiful book, Darwin's Doubt. Tell me, what's the main point of the book? Well, in, in the book, I uh, describe a doubt that Darwin had about the adequacy of his own theory. And his doubt concerned an event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. And we've been talking about it in previous episodes. Uh, the Cambrian Explosion, again, is the 
event in the history of life in which the first complex forms of animal life arise very abruptly in the fossil record. And Darwin recognized that this challenged his picture of the history of life because he thought that life, complex life should arise gradually through a long process of small incremental variation accumulating over time. And instead what we see is a sudden appearance of these major forms of animal life. Um, in the book, I talk about two mysteries. The first mystery is the mystery, the, the mystery of the missing ancestral fossils, the ones that Darwin thought should be there to document that process of gradual change, but those are the ones that are missing. Um, and then I, I talk about a, a deeper mystery, and that's the mystery of how, you, how the evolutionary process would have built these animals. And that mystery, I explained, has become very much more acute because of everything we've learned about the importance of information, in particular genetic information, for building new forms of animal life. And so the book has an overarching argument as well as a story. And that argument is that the theory of intelligent design provides a better explanation for the origin of the information needed to build these Cambrian animals than any of the current materialistic evolutionary theories or models. To be clear, intelligent design is a scientific theory that attempts to explain the existence of life on Earth outside of the theory of evolution. However, Dr. Stephen Meyer is a Christian and believes that God is the designer of the universe. Remarkably, many scientists of earlier centuries believed that God created the universe. Today, notable scientists who hold to the biblical account of creation are often marginalized, ridiculed, and even persecuted within the scientific community. According to this online post, Meyer claims that those who oppose the essentially unanimous international scientific consensus on evolution are persecuted by the scientific community and prevented from publishing their views. In 2001, he signed the statement, A Scientific Descent from Darwinism, coinciding with the launch of the PBS TV series Evolution, saying in part, The number of scientists who question Darwinism is a minority, but it is growing fast. This is happening in the face of fierce attempts to intimidate and suppress legitimate dissent. Young scientists are threatened with deprivation of tenure. Others have seen a consistent pattern of answering scientific arguments with ad hominem attacks. In particular, the series' attempt to stigmatize all critics, including scientists, as religious creationists, is an excellent example of viewpoint discrimination. Students in classes with professors who are overtly opposed to any kind of uh, theistic belief will often feel uh, you know, kind of intimidated and feel like maybe they're the person that didn't get the memo. And I think actually that this is a tremendous time to be, to be going into science uh, if you're interested in the big questions and in particular if you have a theistic perspective because I think we're seeing evidence of design not only in biology but also in physics and in cosmology and I, I think that um, we often get the opposite perspective. You know, the, in the you have the, the the science popularizers are are going to say, you know, science supports the new atheism, or science makes belief in God untenable, or uh, things like that. But when you dig into the evidence, I think there's powerful case for intelligent design. And I personally think that the evidence doesn't just point to a designer generically. But instead, there's a powerful case to be made from the evidence in biology, but also in physics and cosmology, for a designer that has the same attributes, the very attributes that Jews and Christians have long ascribed to God. From the physics, I think we see in what was called the fine-tuning evidence, evidence of design from the very beginning of the universe. And in cosmology, I, I, I see evidence of a, of a definite beginning to the universe that seems to point to the need for a transcendent form of causation, a cause beyond matter, space, time, and energy. And so when, I think when you add all that up, I think there's a very strong case for theism to be made. The first ten words in the Bible say, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Hebrews 11 verse 3 tells us that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Christians believe that God created the world because he told us so. That is sufficient for us to believe that God is the creator, the designer of this universe. We pray that Joe Rogan will humble himself and turn to Jesus for salvation. Please help us spread biblical truth. Subscribe, like, and share. God bless you.